Because what happens tomorrow if the stock, stock market crashes? And grandma had this in a brokerage account. What would happen to the 50,000? Done. So how are we helping out the hood? By you being an example, relating to people in the hood and helping them rise up and out of the hood because your example is success. Yes, why? Because you know when the crisis comes, those with cash will be the bankers. It won't be the local banks, the credit unions, It'll, it's gonna be you. That's how you help the hood. Before any politician can put a, get together policy, you need to be successful before that action happens. Every time this has happened to me, everybody, 01.com bubble, I had cash, I accelerated my business. 0809, great recession, I had cash, I accelerated my business. I became the pawn shop. Some of you guys are thinking, huh, how many guys have grandma, grandpa? Okay, so, so, so some of you guys think that mm, there's no money in the hood. Lots, lots of times people inside the insurance industry think that about our demographic. They no money in the hood. I'm learning, you guys, I'm learning Dallas, okay? What's the hood in Dallas? Okay. Okay. With that being said, how. how <laughs> okay, so those cities that were just mentioned, for those of you that's from Dallas, how many of you are from that, those areas? <laughs> you're from the hood. Yeah. You guys are from the hood. Okay, yeah. you are from the hood. Guess what? You, are, you know, I realize also in Chicago, there's a lot of money in the hood. Yeah. Where do you think drug dealers make the money? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, by the way, isn't that the ch churches, liquor stores, uh, paycheck uh, uh, cashing stations, right? All right next to each other, right? So in other words, there's money in the due to bad financial management. Wow. Okay? Because you figured it out, if you figure out the money game, you probably will not want to live in the hood. Not to say that you forgot the hood, right? What's the best way to help out the hood? You, you, you winning, you, you, you coming from the hood and winning. And then you go back to the hood and you teach people about money. That's how you went in the hood. So how are we helping out the hood? By you being an example, relating to people in the hood and helping them rise up and out of the hood because your example is success, yes? yes? That's how you help the hood. Before any politician can put a, get together policy, you need to be successful before that action happens. Okay, so this is a market you can, you can tap. Why, do I, why am I poking at the hood? Because here's what I realized in Chicago. I'm in the hood, right? Yeah, guys, on, on a serious note, last year we lost two of our agents due to gun violence in Chicago. Okay, from the hood. Both are getting carjacked. And one was picking up his son, and baby mama's boyfriend didn't agree with him, pulled out his gat, shot him in the head. Okay? Thankfully, they had, beforehand, they would not have ever had life insurance. And so I'm on the uncomfortable conversation with the insurance company, hey, make sure the debt benefit is paid out, make sure the debt guess what? They both had enforced life insurance. Not that we ever replace daddy not being here, but thankfully the the mom's got cash to raise a kid. They can, they can raise a kid and get him out of the hood and live in the suburbs and put him in private school and still do ballet and jazz and whatever. At least the kid still has a financial future, okay? All right, so on the flip side, come to find out we got a bunch of people that work for utility companies. People work for the, the cities, the municipalities. What's the number one employer in the, in, the, in the country? What's the number one employer in the United States of America? It's the federal government. And in most cities and states, the largest employers in those cities and states are usually the, the cities and, or state government, okay? And some of them are, for example, my mother, she was a city nurse. My mother worked for the city of Chicago in Cook County Hospital. My mother got a pension from the hood. For example, if you wanted to become a paramedic in the military, guess what which city hospital they'd send you for training, for gunshot wounds? Chicago. Chicago's Cook County, where, where, where my mother was a nurse at. Right, I, I would visit my mother at, uh, at, her, at her hospital because my mother's a NICU peak, you guys know what that is? So the babies, right? Intensive care for the babies. I go visit her, I'm, I'm seeing these babies little smaller than the size of my hand with 15 daggone tubes coming out of their bodies because the kid's addicted to crack, right? Crack babies would be, literally be born in my mother's hospital and trying to resuscitate them, wean them off of crack and sad state, premature babies, you name it, okay? So you go to Cook County for that type of show, with that, the type of uh, uh, training, that type of show. Okay, so. Guess what happened, though, to people working in the hood, city hospitals, the police departments, right? They fund their retirement plan. So there's a, there's a lot of money in the hood. In the city of Chicago, if you go down Madison and Pulaski, that's West Hyde, right? Guess what? There's a Foot Locker there and the House of Hoops. And if you guys know anything about the Foot Locker brand, that's like the upgraded Foot Locker, right? You get Foot Locker, boom, House of Hoops, okay? 
it's not just your, your regular foot uh, brand. They got the, the top of the line, top shelf, foot lock inside. Hood. I used to go down in the west side of Chicago in barbershops. Used to do these BMPs. All these guys cutting hair. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, let me set. Guys, that's what we would do in Chicago. Can we do the same thing here in Dallas? Because there's how much money inside the hood? There's $35 trillion. So in other words, there's a vast amount of money across the United States of America. Now, here's the reality. Some of you guys will never touch a whale. You probably never touch a client with $10 million inside the retirement account. But you can touch a lot of people with $200,000 in a retirement plan. You can touch a lot of people with $300,000 in a retirement plan. You can touch a lot of people with $100,000 in retirement. You can touch a lot of people with $500,000 in a retirement plan. And to them in the hood, they are millionaires. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? That's our crusade. Who's helping them? Nobody but you and I. Yeah. You know why? Who are the Merrill Lynch's helping? Anybody who's got $250,000 and above. Otherwise, you don't talk to somebody at Merrill Lynch at Bank of America. Who's helping a client with $50,000, $80,000, 100000 125 Nobody. You, you know who is? You and I. So here, if you want to help this demographic, I got three case studies for you. Hey, three case studies for you. Number one, how many guys may have a grandma or grandpa that says, hey, you know, I want to leave my kids behind there an inheritance. I want to leave them some cash. Okay. We learned from our last mid-year event, our last big event up in uh, uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. Who do we learn from from an annuity standpoint? Tom, a guy named Tom Hegna, probably the world's most form, foremost authority in terms of annuities. So what do you, uh, Kendrick, can you, can you move this podium, bro? Thanks, bro. So he says, you got an option. You can leave $50,000 of cash in a bank and a CD, a checking account, rubber bands, <laughs> coffee can, right? You can, you can leave this to the kids. But what's the problem with leaving $50,000 of cash to the kids? They receive $50,000. Based on inflation, is $50,000 less valuable tomorrow than it is today? Because $50,000 is going to feel like $45,000. It's going to feel like $40,000. So grandma thinks $50,000 is a lot of money, but it's, she doesn't pass away today, but she passed away 10 years from now. Think about this real quick. Rule of 72. Sem, se, you divide 7.9% interest into 72. What's the math on that? Okay. It's a uh, 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 little, little uh, over six years. So 72 divided by 7.9. I got 9 /11. So 9.11? So in approximately nine years, that 50,000 will feel like 25,000. Hmm. So by the way, that, that goes opposite too. So the rule 72 works in your favor if you're earning 7.9% interest. You, you guys follow me? If you're earning 7.9% interest, your, your 50,000 will be uh, cl uh, uh, closer to 100,000 in, in, uh, in, in uh, nine point, how was it, nine point? Nine point one. So in nine point one years, rule of seventy two says my fifty thousand, if it's a growing at seven point nine percent interest, will be a hundred thousand in seven point nine years or nine point nine nine point one years. I'm missing my numbers. Right. Yeah, I, I just confuse you guys. So back to the rule of seventy two, right? Seventy two, seven point seven point nine percent inflation means that money will double or devalue in nine point one years. So in other words, if you have a seven point nine percent interest working in your favor inside these policies. Inside the accounts that you set up for clients, guess what? Their 50,000 will double to 100,000 in 9.1 years. So far, so good? Yeah. If the inflation rate stays the same, in the same 9.1 years, your 50,000 will be worth 25,000 in 9.1 years. Does that make sense? Yes. So, gra grandma's, got a, grandma's got a choice, okay? Uh, a, she leaves behind cash. Whenever she dies, maybe in 9.1 years, if inflation stays the same, that 50,000 is there. So, so cash, option A, just leave the cash, right? Or option B, she can put this $50,000 into A. Okay, into a life, ins but life insurance policy. Okay, but what, what, what type of, because now we have many different types of life insurance policy, right? So we have two styles. We have term or perm. So term insurance, will, will I, let's, say, let's say grandma's 75 years old. Do you want to sell a 75-year-old a term policy? No. Probably not, because it'll probably expire in five or 10 years, and a premium is massively expensive. And if grandma doesn't die with inside the term, you just paid for it, nothing. Okay? Or do you want permanent? What's, what's, the, different, what's the different versions of permanent life insurance policy? Whole life? Whole life? Universal life? life. F final expense, which is a version of whole life? Or? Index Universal Life. Okay, what's, what's the most conservative and guaranteed of the three, of the three or four we just mentioned? So actually, it's, actually, it's, a, it's, actually, it's actually whole life. It's actually whole life, okay? It's, actually, it's most conservative and guaranteed of the three or four we just mentioned. 
The, 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 the second one would be universal life, and the third, not as conservative, but a little bit more upside, would be the Iowa. So age appropriateness is also what you're looking for in terms of suitability for these particular products. Okay? Aren't you glad you're going to train a trainer? Yes. <laughs> That's why we teach you these things. Okay. Instead of seven, selling a 75-year-old 70, in IUL, which they need some form of guarantees and safety. Okay, so now, how many guys have ever ran a life insurance policy for somebody that's older and you shove $50,000 in there? And by the way, this $50,000 in there, what will it start creating? A, 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 what type of contract? Is it tax, taxable policy or, or non-taxable policy? Tax. If you just shove $50,000 there based on guideline single premium. So in other words, I just want to shove fifty thousand dollars in here and not ever have to pay a life insurance premium ever again. What essentially have you done and created? You've created a who said that? Mech. You've created a modified endowment contract, which means that any growth in there, if you withdraw it, is then taxable. Okay, Corey, you know you're on this stuff. Okay, you just passed your license too. Yes, I did. Good, good for you. Okay. So a modified endowment contract means sure the money's inside the policy, but any gains, if you were to withdraw it, you have to pay what? Okay. So when we set up life insurance policy, we set what we call non mech So when Jesse set up the policy for this, for this guy, right, he set up a guideline, uh, a non mech guideline, means that it doesn't violate the modified endowment contract guidelines, meaning there's a fancy rule out there that was developed called TAMRA, okay, which meant that back then, Wall Street and the banks would say, shit, man, we love this tax haven. And what were the interest rates back in the, in the early 80s? Was it low or high? Yeah, kind of like what we're experiencing right now. So people would move their money from the banks and brokerages into life insurance policies because they would, get, they would be getting 8, 9, 10, 12% return inside life insurance policies. So they're earning this high interest rate but not paying a dime in tax inside old whole life and universal life policies. Until they started creating this law, Tamra, say, hey, you have to have a minimum amount of life insurance on the policy. You just can't have a $1,000 policy. You just can't have a $1,000 policy and have $50,000 in there. You have to have a proportionate amount of life insurance in the policy, if you're gonna have X amount of cash, that's what the Tamar tax law created, okay? So, if grandma was to put $50,000 into whatever variation of policy that you might think is more conservative, whether it be whole life or universal life, it may not be IUL, okay? What do you think this $50,000 will turn into immediately from day one, assuming grandma qualifies for the policy? So some of you life insurance agents, no? How, how much do you guys think it would be worth? I'd say 100 grand? So this policy, immediately from day one, assuming grandma qualified for the life insurance policy, this would be a $100,000 life insurance policy. Okay, How much, now this is a life insurance policy. Under what IRS code does a life insurance policy say to the IRS, you cannot tax this amount? 3702. Oh no. 101A. One, one, one okay, IRS code 101A says any money that you receive from a life insurance policy you do not pay a diamond tax, okay? <clears throat> 7702 is money that grows inside a policy, okay? That, that's a different tax code. But 101A says money that you receive as a death benefit, you do not pay a diamond tax. Any money that you receive as a living benefit, you do not pay a diamond tax. So for example, the guy that built my, my website, Money Smart Guy, he started reading my videos and watching my videos and reading my content. He said, hey man, I think I need a policy from you, why? Because I'm, I'm a dad, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, I've got four kids, I'm married to a uh, sister girl from the south side of Chicago. i got two employees that work for me, they're financially dependent upon me, creating jobs and income. So anyway, we get him a policy, and close out night. So you think, you don't, you think these closeouts are important? Yeah. So anyway, he gets a policy, and close out night. We never thought in 18 months later, at 38 years old, he would suffer a stroke. Mom calls, hey, let me talk to dad. I don't know, mommy, daddy fell asleep on the floor. What? She gets home, he's in the middle of having a stroke. Calls 911, airlift him out to Northwestern Hospital. I mean, make a long story short, thankfully he survives. He was in bad shape though. He was in bad shape. Dustin recovered from stroke. He had a life insurance policy. $200,000 was paid to him without paying a diamond tax. Guess what today he is? He is one of our marketing directors. <laughs> And it's Kenya and his wife, like, can nobody tell me nothing about life insurance? <laughs> can nobody tell me nothing about PHP? It saved my lives. Because we were bold enough to show up on stinking clothes at 1.59 a.m. in the morning, right, Andre Ducille? Close the dog on life insurance policy. That's it. Who's selling somebody a life insurance policy at 1 o'clock in the morning? People that are after, that's it. People that are here, here not necessarily for the money, but here for, listen, I got a crusade that we got to fulfill.
So in this, so this is the play. So instead of leaving cash to the next generation, you stub it inside life insurance. Here's why. Day one, what's this fifty thousand dollars worth from day one? 100. Worth a hundred thousand dollars. So where is grandma going to find an investment that from day one, double. with no risk, double. is going to double in day one? No, never. Zero. Even if you find the best crypto out there before it explodes up, it's not going to happen. And then even if it became a crypto, crypto uh, again, uh, crypto, is crypto now taxable? Yeah, yeah cryptocurrency is now taxable. <laughs> so even if you had $100,000 in crypto gain, if it's a short-term or long-term gain, if it's short-term gain, you're going to pay a higher tax rate. Long-term gain, smaller tax rate of 20%. But still, what rate of return are you going to try to find for grandma that's going to double $50,000, $100,000 from day one and then not pay a dime in tax? So life insurance, for those of you who don't know this, life insurance is the most tax efficient way to pass money from one generation to the other without paying a dime in tax or any disruption in a stock portfolio. Because what happens tomorrow if the stock, stock market crashes and grandma had this in a brokerage account, what would happen to the 50,000? Done. Okay. So, tomorrow the stock market crashes, 50,000 is in a, in a life insurance policy. Guaranteed contract. Okay, so that's one play. You guys got me, got me so far? That's one play. Second play to tap into this to tap into this $35 trillion market. So number one, older, older Americans with money they want to leave behind to their kids. Second play, people that are saving for retirement, they are still in the accumulation phase of retirement, right? What's, what's, the, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the, the three, three major phases, four major phases of retirement planning? Number one is the contribution phase. Second phase is the accumulation phase. Third phase is the distribution phase and number four phase is transfer phase of retirement planning right so I want to contribute to my retirement I want to have my money accumulate I want to distribute my money for income and whatever's left I pass on to the next generation four phases of retirement planning you guys got it yeah. okay so let's say you're in the contribution and accumulation phase of retirement you got a you got somebody there with that uh, that worked at a company for 10 15 20 years and they left the company due to COVID, they got laid off, they got fired because they don't wanna take the vax, whatever the case may be. But they got 100 grand in here, okay? What's, what's one play that you guys can do if somebody's got $100,000 or $50,000 or $250,000 or $50,000 in a former 401k plan at a former employer? What's, what's the move? The annuity is a funding vehicle, but what do you call that? What do you call that? It's called a rollover. Everybody say rollover. Rollover. Okay. And you roll over into what type of tax structure? An IRA. An IRA. What does IRA stand for? Individual, Individual retirement account. account. How many guys never knew what an IRA stood for? How many guys thought IRA was somebody's name? <laughs> By the way, this is part of financial education. Okay? So good for you guys for wanting to come here and wanting to learn. Okay? So you roll it over into an IRA. By the way, who also does that? Who competes with you for this, for this type of transaction with your, cust with your clients in your, in your community? The banks. So you go into a bank, you're looking for, okay, I'm not just looking for the tellers. I'm looking for the other desks that you avoided when you walked into the bank. And one of those desks are the financial services guys that do 401k rollovers, okay? So you do a 401k rollover, say it's $100,000 goes into here. And what type of product do you use? An index annuity. Okay, uh, what's another style of annuity? Fixed. Fixed. What's another style of annuity? Variable. variable. Do we do variable? No, no we don't do variable. Why, why don't we do variable? Because it deals with risk and you need a, what type of license? You need a minimum of a Series 6 and a Series 63 license to do uh, variable annuities. And it's variable annuities for most of your clients, is it something that uh, they would want? What's the only, what's the, what's, what's the big upside of having a variable, just so you guys know that the, the fact that you're selling it, what's the big upside for having a variable annuity in a down economy? So, so let's say your, your, your variable annuity had $100,000, right? What happens if the stock market crashed and now it's worth 50000 you died? What would, your, what would your beneficiary receive? In a variable annuity. Your, 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 your beneficiary actually received 100000 Right? So, so in a variable annuity, the, the fee that you pay for is for your beneficiary to receive whatever you put in there, it, regardless of the stock market drops, okay? So that's the inherent insurance. Now, inside an index annuity, will this ever happen inside an index annuity? Because there's a guaranteed minimum floor. Zero becomes your? Zero. Now, do you have to pay for that? No. no, but do you have to pay for it in a variable annuity? Yes. yes. 
So in other words, you are providing a product that mimics what a variable annuity would do in case a client were to pass away in a down economy without having to pay additional fees. Okay? And so number one, also here, this uh, $100,000. People say annuities have a lot of fees, have a lot of fees, have a lot of fees. What are they referencing to really? What fees are they referencing to? They're really referencing, and by what's a maintenance fee? What, 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 what fee do you pay for an insurance company to manage $100,000? Zero. Zero. You pay zero fees. How much, how much commissions does a client pay you for a $100,000 rollover? Zero. Okay, financial advisor. How much do they have to pay the financial advisor to manage $100,000? At least 1.5%. Some guys charge 3%. So in other words, you're paying fees on the amount that's there with the financial advisor regardless of your account is up or down. You're still paying the fee. How much fees do, how much fees do, do, do you charge your clients for having their money with you inside index annuity? Zero. So are you saving clients a lot of money? Yes. And are, they, are you charging them a commission? No. Zero. Now, with the new rule that was put out, if you're doing a rollover into a qualified plan, you now have to disclose what? How much your how much you now you have to disclose your commission. With the new rule that came out, right? Like, shit, do I really? Hey, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Client, how many people just like you have a $100,000 rollover? Because this is what I'm earning on this rollover. I'm not charging it to you, but the insurance company's paying him. And then how do the insurance companies pay you? From what budget? Marketing. The marketing and advertising budget at the insurance company. Do you know why? Because they figured commercials don't really work. Yep. <laughs> insurance karaoke doesn't work. You know what insurance karaoke is? Yep. Some of you guys don't know what insurance karaoke is. Okay, let, let's start. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I start, you finish. You guys ready? We are farmers. Very good. Okay. Here's another one. Like a good neighbor. <laughs> you guys are good at this. Right? La last one. Last one. Nationwide is. You guys know insurance karaoke. Right? Now, here's the thing. How many, because you knew the insurance song said, hey, honey, we need to call Nationwide and set up our retirement account. That doesn't happen, does it? How do financial products and services actually get distributed to the marketplace? Because an agent sits down to somebody to sell it to them. And how's that edu how do we teach you how to sell to people? You educate them. Okay, Mr. Mr. Client, you have a 401k at a former employer. You have two options. Number one, leave it to chance. It's your former employer. And do you think your former employer has a vested interest to make sure your 401k accumulation value is best optimized for your success? Because it's a former employer, right? Or you can roll it over to a IRA and we can gain control of it. Which would you prefer? Okay, it's great. Let's fill out the paperwork. Fill the paperwork, right? 30 minutes of paperwork, 45 minutes of paperwork, you know, now you got a $100,000 rollover. Now, for those of you that have never done this, let me share with you, but by the way, before I get there, how many feel that doing this 401k rollover is already very beneficial for the client? How many of you guys feel that way, right? Why? Why is, it, why, is it, why is it beneficial to a client? Number one, there's minimum guarantees of protection for the downside. And number two, guaranteed no loss, but potential for upside gain. And then if you use the income rider, you have a guaranteed income right through a, through an annuity. By the way, this is the oldest form of life insurance. Just so you guys know, annuity. Yep. Annuity's been around since before Jesus was ever born. That's how old this has been. And who created it? You can thank our Roman, Roman Empire for this. The Roman Empire, when you retire from the Roman Empire, they paid you something called an annuitatum. Okay? So you retire from the Roman Empire, they paid you an annuitatum, which today is called a? Annuity. annuity. <laughs> Right? So before they created this little life insurance death benefit, they had a guaranteed income for the rest of your life. And that's what you're still providing uh, to this day. Okay, now, what's, what's the other play you can have here? Somebody's still working there, and they are not being, either they're not being matched on their 401k or a portion is being matched. So what's the play? The play is to redirect, redirect what they're not being matched on into a, into a retirement supplement strategy Funded by a IUL, an index universal life policy, or a potential Roth IRA. These are your two options, okay? By the way, can you do both? Yes. yes, you can do both. You can do Roth IRAs and index universal life. What's the downside to a Roth IRA? Now, if they make a certain amount of money, they will be phased out of what they can contribute into a Roth IRA. So the more money you make, the less you can contribute into a Roth IRA. And what's the maximum you can put inside a Roth IRA? 6000 6, a year. So if your client wants to put 1000 a month into a policy, just like we did with this guy, it won't work. Why? Because he's putting in too much money that would be over and above what you can put inside a Roth IRA. And in addition to that, the guy makes, the guy makes some money, right? So his income phases him out of contributing to a Roth IRA because the guy makes a, a lot of money. Okay, so 
What's, what, what happens if somebody's uh, got 6% match, but they're putting in 10% inside a 401k? Haven't take advantage of you? So if they're putting 10% and they're getting matched 6%, what do you want to redirect? So the 4%, that's not being matched, right? You, you, read that, you re redirect that into a, not a, not a rollover, but inside an IUL. Or a, or a Roth IRA. Roth IRA, which is funded by a index annuity. So these are some options you have. The, you, by the way, do you, do you already have like three or four plays just with these two right here? Yeah. yeah. With your insurance license. That's how powerful your life insurance license is. Okay, third play, I'll wrap up with this. Strategic equity uh, finance from trapped equity. Now. Uh, his property value inside, kind of touched on this last week, has property value increased or decreased in Dallas? Increased. increased. It's increased. Okay. So in this example, I put a three hundred fifty. somebody bought a $350,000 house. Would it be safe to say that over the last five, six, seven years, that $350,000 house probably appreciated to $500,000? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. So that's a safe number. I don't know. You guys educated me. Yeah, no, okay. So let's say this $350,000 house grew to $500,000. In a, typical, in a typical mortgage, non-FHA, what's the normal down payment for a lot of people to buy a house? You, you, usually 10 to 20%, right? So I'm gonna be very conservative. Let's say they put 10% down, okay? So what's 10% of 350,000? It's 35,000. So what do they really mortgage on a house? 315, right? So 315 is what they got the mortgage on. So based on, I, I Google this, five years ago, the mortgage rates were approximately 4%. So let's say they bought the house five years ago at a 4% interest rate, and the mortgage balance was 315 at that time when they first started. Now this person wanted to add, because they were told by Dave Ramsey, they were told by the financial advisor, they were told by the pastor, hey, pay off the house, pay off the house, pay off the house, pay off the house. Okay, is it a wife strategy? Cool. They did it? Fine. So they're sending another $500 a month extra into the mortgage. So on top of their $1691, they're adding another $500 to do what? To accelerate the payoff of the house, because they want to be debt free. Now, two, two types of debt, right? Good debt, bad debt, yes? Yeah. What's, what's good debt? Real estate, that's good debt. Okay, that's about it if, that, if, you're, not a, if you're not an entrepreneur. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, what's another form of good debt? Business debt. Why, bless you. Why, why, is, business debt, why is business debt good debt? Because interest that you, owe, that you owe and you're paying on a monthly basis for paying off business interest is what? Tax? Deductible. Tax deductible. Okay, so for example, Apple's got, Apple and Amazon, they got 86 and $90 billion of cash just sitting on the side. When they acquire a company, do they pay cash for the company or do they use a loan to buy the company? Why do they use a loan? Why don't they just pay cash for it? Huh, it's interesting, huh? Our CEO founder, Patrick David, his $25 million house that he bought in Fort Lauderdale, do you buy cash for it or do you use a loan for it? What type of loan? Here's the thing, it's, by the way, it's all, it's all written up, so I'm not sharing with you some insider information that isn't publicly known. Did Patrick have enough cash to pay for the house cash? Yes. But instead of using his cash at his Goldman Sachs account, Goldman Sachs said, hey, here's a line of. So in order for you to close, instead of you waiting on the mortgage 60, 90 days, why don't you make a strong offer? And part of strong offer is not only the amount, but also how fast you can close. So guess what happens when you have a lot of, lot of money inside a brokerage account and they give you a line of credit? You go to the line of credit, you just write a check on the line of credit. So basically, essentially, to the title company, you're buying it with what? Cash. So Patrick makes an offer. Uh, 20 million, we can close in 30 days. Buyer's like, damn, you're not financing it? No, none of your business, how I'm buying it? Here's, here's 20 million bucks. Buyer says, shit, I'll take the offer. <laughs> so in 30 days, he closed on the house. Now, what does he do after that? So where do you use the $20 million from? The line of credit. So at, at, at the end of closing, six months later, guess what Patrick does to get his $20 million back to pay off his line of credit? He then refinances it. You guys get it? To pay off the line of credit. And the, the, the mortgage interest now he's paying on his personal credit, whereas if there's a personal credit or his business credit, either way, he refinanced the cash. Why? Because you want control of what? Your capital. What, what, are four, what are the four characteristics that we talk about that your clients need to have? So in other words, somebody says, hey, put your money here, put your money here, put your money here. And you say, oh, okay, why? Well, this dang gone crypto is going at 500%. Okay, should that be your only criteria of where and why you should put your money somewhere? No. So somebody gives you, somebody, somebody gives you a, a, an opportunity. How do you process systematically of whether to say yes or no? And this is something you need to know and something you need to teach your clients. Every opportunity should have at least four elements. This is your system. Why do you use a system? Because the more systematic you are in making decisions, the less emotional you are. And how, how, do you, how many guys know that usually money, you're very emotional about it. Okay, so what's, what's the criteria? You guys know the laser test? 
What's the laser test? L stands for? Liquid. Liquid. This is what I'm talking about laser test. Okay? L S R T. Laser test. Okay? Your any investment opportunity should have, in our opinion, you can be there for many different people, but in general, what works for us to keep you safe and secure has these four qualities. Just remember laser test. L S R T. L stands for? Liquidity. You're right. It's liquid. It's liquid. You got liquidity. Okay? So in other words, you put your money in, and fairly relatively soon you can get your money back out. S stands for? Safety. Safety. Is money inside uh, this particular opportunity safe? Yes. Okay. Well, well, let's say someone puts in Bitcoin. Is it safe? No. Okay. But it does have a, R stands for? Rate of, Rate of return potential. Usually people focus only on this. Last but not least, what does T stand for? Tax advantage. Tax advantage. I want to make sure that whatever money I have growing, I can keep on Georgia due to keeping Uncle Sam and Cousin Texas or Cousin Illinois or Cousin California out of my <laughs> pocket. Okay. Out of my pocket. So these are the characteristics. So anybody that you're talking to this weekend, say, hey, put your money here, put your money to Cardano, put your money towards real estate, put your money to buying raw land, great. Does they have these four criteria? Hey, Cuzzo, did you, did you pass it through a criteria or are you just emotional about it? So now you look a little bit more seasoned and educated when it comes to <laughs> pragmatic, in, right? Pragmatic investment opportunities. That's that's the way you 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 would want to. Uh, right? Do, do you think? Do you think? For example, we met Tom Brady. Where, where, is David Goldman still here? No. Or is he out there? He's out there, right? So, for example, we met Tom Brady's business manager, right? For TB12 last 15 years. So, one of the questions I asked him is, how, how does Tom Brady, how does Tom Brady pick a brand and what to endorse and get a paycheck from? So he tells me he's got to meet three criteria. See? So even rich people have our criteria of what to say yes to and what to say no to. Okay, and maybe down the recap, for those you qualified for the recap, you'll be the first to find out. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> huh? All right. All right, cool. So these things. Now, back to my example here. They're setting an initial $500 a month extra. So are they decreasing or increasing the equity inside the property by adding an extra payment into additionally paying off their mortgage? They're, they're, they're seeking to potentially increase it. But who, who's got the other hand in that factor of a property appreciating? So that no, w w uh, one play, they can pay down the mortgage to potentially increase the equity, right? And then what also has to happen in order for the property to increase? The market has to respond. So in other words, your neighbor has to sell it for a higher value than what they bought for. Your neighbor has to sell it for the, the same, what do you call that, uh, what, uh, real estate? Uh, same comp, that's correct, the same comp. The same comparable property has to sell at a higher value in order for the equity in your property to also increase. Okay. So we, if you got those factors going on, which for the most part, Dallas has got going on right now, which means that a large, large part of your clientele not only has net worth and wealth inside their retirement accounts, but they also have it trapped where? In their equity, in the real estate, in their homes. They're living in their money. So when you're, when you're sitting down with them doing a proper FLS, that's why you should ask them what their mortgage is like. So... When you ask them, what's, what's the mortgage balance on your property? What's the interest rate? What's the payment that you have on the mortgage? Tax, P-I-T-I. What's P-I-T-I mean? Principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. You got it, my man. P-I-T-I. See, you sound a little bit more educated coming out of this class today. Okay? Excuse me, what's the, what's the pity on your mortgage payment? <laughs> what does it stand for? I don't remember, but uh, I'm just asking you a question. <laughs> P-I-T-I. What does it stand for again? Principal and interest, taxes, and insurance. Okay, and some of you fancy ones live in a fancy neighborhood. Yeah, uh, what's also the HOA fees, right? Uh, right? Homeowners association fees, right? Depending on your neighborhood, because your homes all got kind of look like the same way. Okay, right? <laughs> Not so in DeSoto, apparently. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. So, so now over time, over the last five, six, seven years, the property value grew from 350. In addition to the additional mortgage payments the client's been sending to the to the uh, mortgage company, the property grew to five hundred thousand dollars. So how much equity is now inside the property? A buck fifty, right? So five hundred minus three fifty is. It's two fifty. It's two fifty, right? So that, excuse me, one fifty. Yeah, where's, where's, where's my math, right? So. So the three fifty and the five hundred thousand, they have this equity trapped up inside the house, right? Okay. Now, the question for you is, how much of that equity is putting money in your pocket? Right. So for example, the better question is. If you had $150,000 of an investment, do you want to put money in your pocket every month? Of course. I got 150 grand out there, I want to put money in my pocket because that's the way rich people make money. You, th you think uh, uh, my investments in other businesses put money in my pocket every month? Of course. 
Because that's why we invest in companies. They pay you a dividend, you're sharing the profits of the company. So the re reason you're, a lot of people aren't enjoying it here because it's trapped up inside a 401k account that you can't touch until you're 59 and a half years old. But if you had a $150,000 investment outside of a 401k, don't you want that money putting you in, in your pocket today? So in this, here's the move. I'll finish up with this. I promise. <laughs> promise. So now in this move, here's the play. You cash out refinance, you refinance a house, not at 315, but you refinance a house with 80%, what's 80% of 500,000? It's 420, right? So the 420, you, you refinance a house at 420, because it's 80% loan to value, right? So again, what's 80%, do the math, what's 80% of 500,000? It's 420, okay? So 420,000 dollars. Now, what's the difference between 420, the difference between 420 and 315? Uh, 420, uh, 420 and 315 is? Is it 105? Yeah. Okay. So 105K, now if you've released from being trapped, because this 105,000 inside the house, was it earning any interest? No. no. Now that you released it and you put inside a potential in the index universal life policy, will it have some form of rate of return? Oh, yeah. Yes. So now you've unlocked the interest on this 105, which previously was not. But here's the flip side. Instead of you sending an additional payment to the mortgage company, you, refi you, you, you refinance the house because your mortgage payment went from 1691 to 2147, essentially 500 bucks, right? But you're pay would, you, would you pay 500 bucks to have access to 105? And, and, that, and then is mortgage interest, according to the IRS today, tax deductible? Yes, because you, you receive a 1098 at the end of the year for mortgage introduction to filing your tax forms. So the interest that you just refinanced, now, even though it's a larger amount, now it's tax deductible on your personal, and your personal, uh, um, personal income taxes. But the difference now is you released $105,000. And then you can put this inside index reverse life, or you can say, hey, let me set aside $20,000, $30,000, okay, as down payment to buy more real estate. Why, because you know when the crisis comes, those with cash will be the bankers. It won't be the local banks, the credit unions, It'll be, it's gonna be you. You'll be the local bank. Every time this has happened to me, everybody, 01.com bubble, I had cash, I accelerated my business. 0809, great recession, I had cash, I accelerated my business. I became the pawn shop, <laughs> right? I became the pawn shop, I became the, I became the hard money lender. Bobby? Isn't that how uh, hard money lenders? That's, that's, you're the hard money lender now. You know what, you know what, hard, what, you know what he means by that term? How many of you guys know what he means by hard money lender? Okay, the real estate investors know what that is. In other words, without, for lack of a better term, you're, you're the loan shark. Okay? So if somebody said, hey man, I need $50,000 to complete my real estate project. I was like, I got the cash. You want to close on property? Great. I'll, sh I'll see you at the title company. I'll present a certified check for $50,000. But now I have a promissory note with you that you pay me 12% interest or 50% interest or 20% interest in the next 90 days or, or I secure your property. Now your property is mine. That's the way a hard money lender works if you don't pay money back, okay? Now let's say they don't, they say they don't pay you 90 days. Well, guess what you, have, what, you, what you have now is another asset. You have another house. And then you negotiate with them. Listen, you promised to pay me in 90 days. You want to complete the project? I'll cut some of the interest off. Again, you're, 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 the, you're the bank. You negotiate the terms now. But legally and ethically, you've made your play. Why? Because you made money and you stacked cash. And you became the bank. For some of you saving this money inside, so I this, and I'm, I'm excited for you in the next one year, two years, but for some of you, I've been thinking about 10, 15, 20 years from now. Think about how old you'll be in 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Some of you guys are not even my age yet. You'll be much further ahead financially before you even hit, hit 48 years old. Mm. Think about how old you're gonna be in the next 10, 15 years. How much more financially stacked will you be if you uh, really apply yourself in business? So don't, just, just, just don't think short term, think long term. Now, with that being said, uh, on a $105,000 life insurance policy, of, of cash coming in. So 105 divided by five is what? Divide this by five. What? A little over 21,000? Yeah. Now you're, you're structuring your policy, 21,000 a year, 21,000 a year, right? Or, or, or a five year period, if you guys can read my writing. So 21,000 a year into the policy. 21,000 a year into the policy. 20,000 a year into the policy, coming from where? From money that was normally inside, inside, the, inside the home. But you're putting 21, so how come, Matt, we can't put $105,000 in time policy? Back to this one. Because now we're gonna create a modified endowment contract. Because why? Money that grows inside a policy, that's a modified endowment contract, becomes taxable. So, so the rule here is another rule in 1988 called TAMRA, okay? 
First one is Tefra. Oh, shoot, this is Tefra. Tef Tefra. This one is Tamra. 1980. 1984 is Defra. Right, Jesse? You got that. So, Tefra, yeah, Tefra here, 1982, Tamra, 1988. So, this forced you to not throw all this cash in all at one time. This tax law said you got to spill in this money over a four or five year period. And then money, according to then 7702, means money that accumulates inside this policy can be withdrawn without paying a diamond tax. So you're not, you finally got this 105000 inside this policy. Now who's in control of that money? You. you are. Before, who's in control of the money? Banks. The banks. Right? Just so you know, uh, there's one, one or two ways you're going to own property. Either you completely mortgage all the way to the hilt, or you completely pay it off. Anywhere in between, it's kind of risky. Why? Because you're exposing your equity to either market conditions or your inability to pay it based on a uh, change in income. Because think about this, you lose your job. You lose your job. You got, you got all this trapped equity. You got $150,000 of trapped equity inside your house. You lose your job. You run out of unemployment checks. You drain down your 401k plan. But you got $105,000 stuck, $150, stuck in your house. How do you access it? You can't, because will the bank allow you to access money inside your own property without income? No. So who's in control of the equity inside your house? The banks are. Now, what are you putting, what are you putting more in favor by doing a strategic cash out refinance? Who are you putting more in favor? You, you as a homeowner. And the way you structure this, because this, this is life insurance, right? What do you want to make sure? You have a, at least a $400,000, $450,000 debt benefit. So in case something happens to a client, the mortgage balance is completely paid off. Anyway, that's the move. That's the play. That's what you do.